So if you were a troublemaker, this is where you'd end up. What's up with that? I'm with my lovely daughter Kayla today, and we are in remote New Mexico. We welcome you to Fort Union National Monument, military life on the frontier in the 1800s. Now, before we start our stroll, I'd like to set the stage for why there is this big fort seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Hey, we're gonna go check out the center of the fort right now. And I love coming to these national sites where we almost have the entire place to ourselves. Let's go. You can see we're right in the center of the fort right now. Here's the, the marking of the mighty Santa Fe Trail that started out that way toward Missouri, branched off, came through the fort, and then all those branches converged together to make their way to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And then from there, it would go on to other locations. But this is neat because hundreds of people would pass right through this section every single day. So as we are making our way into the interior portion of the fort, you can see over my right shoulder, the hospital. They said if you stay at the hospital, and they treated everything, uh, it was 50 cents a day. Also, this hospital was known as the best hospital within 500 miles. What's also interesting is that the hospital is in this corner, and about 300 yards away, in the opposite corner is the supply depot. They were as far apart as possible. That, in a sense, was the heart of this fort. This third fort, on top of having an active garrison, is going to be really designed as a depot of military supply to ensure that the Santa Fe Trail is doing its job. You can see why they needed so many storehouse buildings. They say that every single day coming down the Santa Fe Trail, there would be anywhere between 30 and 100 wagon trains. That's not 130 wagons, that's 130 wagon trains. And each wagon train could have up to 200 wagons in it. People picking up supplies, people dropping off supplies. I'll give you a little list of all the supplies, a typical shipment of what came in. And then all those shipments would be inventoried and organized and then redistributed to some, oh, I don't know, what do you think, about 30 different forts out here in the southwest. So this was the hub, they'd all come here, and then they get farmed out to the other forts as well. That's how the supplies came in. And you got that many people here and that many forts. You need a lot of stuff to keep the people alive. Support buildings for you. You have your military prison, your uh, mess hall, quarters for uh, laundresses, married enlisted men. Across from the garrison, you have the depot. These were the homes and offices for the quartermaster and his staff, the warehouses where the supplies are stepped, kept and stored before being reloaded and sent to other outposts. The transportation corral where everything from government mules to cavalry horses were stored and fed. These are just two heads. The final piece is, of course, the fort's arsenal where munitions were actively stored and manufactured. cannon would fire, the flag was raised, the troops were assembled and inspected, sent on their duties. At the end of the day, the retreat parade was played, flag was lowered, cannon was fired, and the troops were sent to the barracks. This is an interesting shot right here. There are the parade grounds. You see the flagpole off in the distance. Over here on my right is where the depot was, and the barracks quarters, and then officers row on the left. They had their own section with their beautiful houses where they can often stay with their families. You check out that beauty. If you were a commanding officer, you had multiple fireplaces in your house. And most of these structures were made out of adobe bricks covered with adobe plaster. But if you were an officer and you had a fireplace, those were made out of traditional bricks. And they didn't make those here. They put them on a wagon, one ton at a time on a wagon. 
and ship them all the way out here from Missouri. And this is where we come to our territorial prison. Not only taking care of soldiers, but also civilians. I'm gonna step up here real quick to make sure we don't have any of our slithering or rattling friends hanging out in the cool shade of the cells. Afterwards, I'll invite you guys up to take a look. Please watch your step and keep a note when you put yourself in those cells that at each peak, you would have had nearly five men per cell. Tight quarters, a bucket in the middle. This is where civilian and military authority can be exercised against crime. Fort Union starts to wind down in the 1880s. 1878, for the first time, the railroad makes it over Raton Pass. Two years later, it's in Santa Fe. Well, traffic on the overland Santa Fe Trail starts to slow, and you no longer need a large garrison of troops to protect and patrol it. You no longer need warehouses to hold military supplies that aren't coming. In the early 1880s, the arsenal and depot are closed and the garrison starts to shrink. In 1891, Fort Union finally comes to a close after four decades of operation. And it does so because its job is done. The West is won. By 1891, as a new century gets ready to dawn, it's a very different West. For the most part, the open range is being cut up and subdivided by barbed wire. The massive buffalo herds, which once numbered four and a half million and were the subsistence of life and culture for the tribes that lived in the Great Plains, well, they're almost all gone. And in their wake, cattle trails are opening up. Overland trails are replaced with iron rails. Settlements are growing. Fort Union has done its job. The West is one. And that's why Fort Union is here as a national monument to be a bookmark in this chapter of history where a young United States forcefully expanded itself into the West and would come to define the next century forward. For those of us that live and travel the West, where we get things like wide open skies, quiet vistas, everything from the sublime, from standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon to the novelty of Disneyland. All of the West was fought and paid for at a very high price. And that's why Fort Union stands. So with that, folks, thank you very much for joining me on a tour through scratching the surface here at Fort Union. There's a lot more to delve into. And unfortunately, even though our ruins aren't in the best shape, it's not really the walls that are significant. It's the stories and history that give them context. And we're extraordinarily lucky that even though the walls are falling, this valley has been untouched for the last 170 years. So we almost get that same view, whether we were some of the first troops here or the Hickory Apache living near the edge of the turkeys. Almost get that same view and almost that same quiet. So from this hot location in New Mexico, we want to thank you for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it educational and beautiful as well. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to our channel. And remember, there's always room for you here at America's Parks on our next National Park Adventure.